name, amen. Luke chapter 1, verse, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. John taught his disciples to pray. Jesus taught the 12 disciples to pray. We are now the disciples of the Lord, and we need taught to pray. I shared in my first session how that I was not taught the things that make up prayer and being effective in prayer. No one taught me coming up how to pray. I guess everyone just thought that would come naturally to me or or I would just work my way through, and yet for years I didn't work my way through. I needed to be taught even why to pray, which is so foundational. Why do we pray? I needed to be taught where do we pray, when do we pray, and how do we pray? How do we pray? It's not enough just to pray, saints. Just praying isn't going to necessarily get her done. Prayer is a part of getting her done, amen? But just praying in and of itself is not necessarily going to... To change things in your life, you need to know how to pray, what to pray, when to pray, and even, even why to pray. What I want to look at this morning is why do we pray? What is the purpose of prayer? Because be honest, if you're not in this category I'm about to, to elaborate on, you know somebody in this category, and that is people who are born again, love God, but don't pray. They don't pray. Why don't people pray? The reasons are numerous. There's a host of them. But one of the reasons people don't pray is they really don't think it matters. They really don't think it matters. Or they don't think it really will change things or, or make, a, make a difference. I've met people like that. I was in that category that I, I really wasn't sure if my prayers were changing anything. I also fell into this category of I had prayed but seemingly failed. I had prayed for years and didn't seemingly see an answer or see anything change. You know, you can get discouraged if you've prayed for years and not seen one prayer answered. There could come a point in your life that you just feel like this isn't working or I don't know what I'm doing, so what's the use? I'm not going to pray. The number one reason that people do not pray is a misunderstanding or a misapplication of the sovereignty of God. There are a lot of people like I was that grew up in a system where we were taught that everything that happens in the earth is God's will. And that whatever God allows, He wills. After all, God is sovereign, capital S. And if God is sovereign over the earth and God is sovereign over the universe, that there is nothing that happens in this earth but what God allows. And if God allows it... He, he wills it. Saints, there's a lot of things God allows that He does not will. And yet that's taught to many people. And many people mis, misunderstand or misapply the sovereignty of God and even things that the devil does. I've heard people say, well, since God allowed the devil to even do that, God still willed it. That is just not right. In James chapter 4, and there's a host of scriptures that counter that theology, and yet you'd be surprised how many people think that the sovereignty of God means whatever happens is the will of God. Whatever is, is. Que sera, sera. Que safui, safui. There's a lot of stuff that's happening that God doesn't will. God's fingerprints on, aren't on it. And James, the brother of Jesus, said in James chapter 4, verse 7, that we have to submit unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee. God says there's some things you're to submit to and some things you are to resist. The things that are of the devil, I'm not to submit to that and tag God's will on the end of it or some divine purpose. I'm supposed to resist it. And the devil will not flee if I don't submit to God and resist him. If you believe everything that happens is God and God's will for your life, you're going to get steamrolled over by the devil, I can assure you. You're going to be a train wreck, saints, because there's a lot of stuff happening in your life, in my life, in our church, in our city, in our world. It has nothing to do with the will of God. And prayer, and a part of prayer, is, is learning what's of God and learning what's of the devil and submitting to God, resist the devil, and then he flee. In Genesis chapter 3, I don't know how people can miss this. God creates a perfect man, perfect woman, puts them in a garden, 
puts a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in that garden. And while I don't have all the answers on why God did that, there had to be a choice in order for man to have a free will. God didn't create us like animals with instinct and pre-program us to serve him, pre-program us to love him. God created man in his image and in his likeness. And one of the images of God and likenesses of God is free will. And he gave man a free will. And you really don't have a free will unless you have a choice. So there had to be one tree that you couldn't eat of so that you could make a choice. Am I going to serve me or serve God? Am I going to love me or love God? Am I going to obey my dictates of my flesh or am I going to obey God? So God tells Adam and Eve, do not eat of that tree. Can I get a witness that God's word is his will? Oh, I need a better, I'm on the easy stuff now, saints. I need a better witness than that. When God says something, that's his will. He said, here's my will. Do not eat of the tree. And if you do, that the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. So God said, don't do it. And God said, if you do it, there's going to be consequences. Now, did God allow the devil or some created being? And I don't have time to explain that. That's not my topic. But did God allow Eve to be tempted? Did God allow Eve to be deceived? Did God allow Adam to enter on into that temptation? Did God allow that in the garden? Yes. But he didn't will it. He already told them his will. So you're supposed to be bright enough and smart enough to know that God allows a lot of things. He does not will. God allows children to be molested. But don't you ever get twisted in your mind. And don't you get some religious idea put in your head that God ever willed or ordained for a child to be molested. And he has some higher purpose or will for that child. And I wonder what it is. That is not God's will. If you get raped, I'm telling you, it's not God's will. And while he allows it, that doesn't mean he wills it. If you take the life of somebody else, that is not God's will. And he may allow it, but you're going to stand accountable in the day of judgment for that. Because you're the one that did that, not God. You're the one that allowed that, not God. We're the ones that are allowing things in this earth, not God, that are contrary to his will. The Bible is so clear on these things, yet there's so much confusion in so many Christians. In John chapter 3, verse 16, the scriptures say, Jesus speaking, that God so loved the world. He loved everybody that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. You've got to have help to miss 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. But he, he, he is faithful toward us, not willing, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Did you know God wills for everybody to be saved? But just because God wills for everybody to be saved doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved. God will allow you to go to hell if you want to go to hell. God won't override your will right straight to the gates of hell. And Jesus said that hell was created for the devil and his angels. Did you know God didn't create hell for people? God didn't create hell to send people there. God created hell for the devil and his angels. And the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that hell has enlarged her mouth to receive the wicked. Why has hell and why does hell enlarge its mouth to receive the wicked? Because God created it just big enough for the devil and his angels and he doesn't want anybody to go there. So if you choose to go to hell, if you choose to reject God's love, if you choose to reject Jesus Christ, his plan of your redemption and salvation, his sacrifice for all of your sins, the payment for every mistake you've ever made, if you reject that, There's no choice but for God to honor your free will. And you go to what I call a devil's hell. A devil's hell. Man, there's a lot of stuff going on in this earth that God allows. But just because he allows it does not mean he wills it. That's why we're supposed to pray. That's why Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. He said, when you pray, here's how you pray. Call him your father. Our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Why would Jesus tell us to pray for God's will to be done in the earth as it is in heaven if his will is automatic in the earth? Think about that. Jesus would have never taught us or told us to pray for God's will to be done in the earth if it's just automatically being done. We have been confused. We've been duped. 
And many of us have bought into, again, because God is sovereign, somehow or another that means that whatever he allows, he wills. Did you know God will allow you to get up right now, walk out of here, and go have an affair? But don't you sit in my office and try to dupe me saying, God must have had some higher purpose. God must have willed this because he's sovereign and he wouldn't allow anything he didn't will and he allowed me to have that affair. All I know that he allows right now is for me to slap the snot out of you and wake you up and rebuke you and say, don't you ever sleep with anybody but your wife. It's never God's will for you to have an affair. It's never God's will for you to do contrary to what he told you to do. And don't you get confused like that. You submit unto God, you resist the devil, and he will flee. Now, what I want to do now is I want to give you eight things that I've learned that I had to dig out on my own and that I've experienced in prayer. There's really not a lot out there on prayer. And that's, that's amazing to me. And so we need these eight things established in our heart. I'm going to be referring to them over the next few months. And so I'm going to highlight them now. Number one, why do we pray? What's the purpose of prayer? Number one, number one, we pray because... Prayer is for fellowship and relationship with God. Prayer is fellowshipping with God. And it's to develop our relationship with God. Listen to me, dear ones. God is a person. He's not a man like you and I are a man, but he's a person. He's your father. You're his children and he wants to talk to you. He loves you. He delights in you. He finds pleasure in you. And he wants you to have a dialogue with him. For years, prayer for me was a monologue. I did all the talking. <laughs> I didn't know it was supposed to be a dialogue. And that I'm supposed to talk, yes, but listen, I'm supposed to listen. It's supposed to be a two-way conversation. Now, last night, I didn't clarify that. And some things were said after the service that really helped me do a better job today. You know, I'm not saying where I'm at today that every time I pray, I hear God and a response from God, and it is a total dialogue. Many times in prayer, to this day for me, it is a monologue in the sense of I don't hear God immediately. But listen to me carefully. God says many things in silence. God says more in 15 minutes of silence than most of us babbling preachers can say in a lifetime. Did you know one of the greatest fears my wife and children and close friends have is when I won't talk? Think about it. I say more in silence sometimes than I can say with, with this limited vocabulary that I have. Did you know God is speaking to you in silence? Well, what's he saying? He's saying, keep seeking him. He's saying, wait. He's saying, listen better. He's saying, learn to hear. He's saying a lot of things to you, even in silence. So... While it's not a dialogue like I'm talking and I hear God clear and he talks and I talk and he talks, there is and I have evolved into my prayer life where I fellowship with God and it's relational. God wants to know you. God wants to walk with you. God is very personal in your relationship with him and prayer develops that. Number two, second reason to pray or why pray is prayer changes us and circumstances and in time, our world. Prayer changes us. I prayed for years, wasting time trying to change God. I found out that if I will pray, and I will pray the way the Bible teaches me to pray, I change. I'm being changed through prayer. Circumstances are being changed through prayer. And my world can be impacted and changed through prayer. Number three, prayer is the avenue by which God has ordained for us to receive our provisions provided in Jesus. I love that. Prayer is ordained by God. God called us to pray. Prayer is God's idea, not man's idea. And God is the one that ordained that through prayer, the avenue of me receiving all the promises come. See, God doesn't want to be perceived. The Father doesn't want to be perceived as a slot machine of the universe that you pull a handle and get your cookie. God wants to talk about it. God wants you to ask him for things he's already provided. That used to confuse me. Jesus said, oh, by the way, before you pray, your heavenly father knows what you have need of before you even ask. And my attitude at church used to be, well, if God already knows what I have need of before I ask, why do I have to ask? Why doesn't it just fall on me like ripe cherries off a tree? Because God ordained that I ask. He said, you have not, not because I haven't provided 
He says, you have not because you ask not. And you receive not when you ask because you ask amiss. So God is the one that said, I already know what you need before you ask, but ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. God doesn't want to just even give us things without talking to us about it, saints. Even with my own children. I don't want to just hand things out to them and just give them provisions. I want them to know why I'm given the provision. I want them to know uh, when and, and where I wouldn't give the provision. Did you know under certain circumstances, I would not bless my kids. I wouldn't give them something just to give it to them. If I thought it would hurt or, or harm them, or mess up their character, I wouldn't give it to them. Some of you, I love you. You're just rich. I envy you. You're blessed. But boy, if you're not careful, you can ruin your kids. Just give them everything without them asking, seeking, and knocking. Without relationship and developing. God has already provided everything I need in Jesus, but he wants me to ask. He wants me to knock. He wants me to seek because that's when I develop the relationship with him. And that's when I understand the purpose of the provision. Not just pulling a handle on a slot machine and getting my cookie. God's the one that ordained that we ask. And through prayer comes the provisions Jesus has provided. Number four, God or prayer is God and man working together in the earth. I'm going to elaborate on that in this service. Prayer is God and man working together in the earth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9, Paul says we are co-laborers together with the Lord. Co-laborers together with the Lord. He planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. They were co-laborers together. Write down 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I love it. Verse 1. Paul speaking, we then as workers together with him. I like that. We then as workers together with him. And then he went on to share some things with him. In other words, I'm not doing this of my own accord. I'm in partnership with my father. We as workers together with God. You know what God wants out of you and what he wants out of me? He wants partnership. He wants us to work together in the earth. See, God's not working in the earth independent of man. And man better quit working in the earth independent of God. God working in the earth independent of man in the Bible is called judgment. Did you know God will override your will? God, God won't ask for you to be a vessel or a channel in final judgment. God as a sovereign God, capital S, reserves the right to judge a person, judge a group... Or judge a nation. And, and we don't want God working independent of us. Because when God works independent of us, it's in final judgment. Man working independent of God is called religion. And it's dead. And it's burdensome. Man working independent of God comes up with his own ideas, his own rules, his own ways. And he tries to approach unto God on his terms to... to to gain access to God or to receive something from God. And that's total death. Man, I don't want to work without God. That's religion. And I don't want God working without me. That's judgment. I want to be a co-labor together with God. Amen. When I'm praying, I'm partnering with God, seeing his will come into the earth. That'll be a, a number at the end. Number five. Number five, prayer is not man convincing God to change his will and conform to mine. <laughs> I wish someone would have told me that when I was a teenager. I thought prayer was me coming up with an idea and trying to get God to sign off on it. And that's why I wasn't seeing any prayers answered. I didn't have me to tell me what I'm telling you. I wish Dwayne Sheriff would have been in my life when I was a teenager. I think you understand what I'm saying. I didn't have anybody to explain to me, look, it doesn't work that way. You don't come up with stuff on your own. Try to convince God to conform to what you want. You get in prayer and you find out what God wants. You accept what God wants as your will now. And you'll see God conform you to his will. I wanted to conform God to my will. And that wasn't working for me. Number six, prayer is not me convincing God that I'm right and know what's best. <laughs> I did that for years. I know what's right. And I know what's best for me. Help me out here. Did you know I love you, but you're not real bright, saints. I'm not putting you down. But you don't even know your own heart. You don't always know what's right, and you don't know what's best for you. God knows what's right, and he knows what's best for you. 
Even at this stage in my life, I've, I've had to go to God and say, Search my heart, O God. And if there be any wicked way in me, re- reveal it to me. My own heart will deceive me. I don't even know what's in there sometimes, but God does. And if I'll give him my heart, he'll search it and he'll show me. I'm not thinking right. My attitude's not right. That direction's not right. I don't, need to, I don't pastor this church coming to God saying, Here's what I want to do, and I think it's best for victory life. Would you sign off on it? No, I've got to seek God and find out what God tells me is best for our church. Amen or oh man. That's, that's so important and so novel to most, most pastors even and most Christians. Did you know a lot of people in their immaturity and in their youth will make the most important decision of their life and try to get God to bless it, try to get God to sign off on it. They say, this is what I want. That's what I want in a wife. That's what I want in a, in a marriage. That's what I need. That's what I want. We try to get God in prayer to sign off on it. Saints, I didn't know what I wanted. I thought I knew what I wanted. Most young men don't have any idea what they want or even need in a wife. God knows that. Most young men are looking for someone who's been drinking milk and it's done their body good. But I'm telling you the truth, look around you. 40 years later, the milk won't cut it. (laughs) Amen. I thank God. God knew what was best for me. God knew what I needed. And Sue is the best thing this side of heaven that ever happened to me. God knew she was best. God knew 31 years later she would be taking notes. God knew she'd be a supportive wife. God knew she wouldn't nag me. God knew... But she doesn't need milk and her body still looks good. Hallelujah. Amen? Sorry, I had to throw that one in there. I won't keep this tape. I'm going to keep this tape. I want it on record that I said her body still looks good. Can I get a witness? Amen. We think we know what's best. We know what's right. And we try to get God to sign off instead of praying and yielding to God. And God showing us what's right for us. And what's best for us. See God knows your future better than you know your past. And prayer. A good prayer life. Is going to make you so much more successful and happy. If you learn how. What. Where. And why to pray. And why to pray. Number seven. Prayer is not a tug of war. To see who wins. I've done that. Been there. Got the t-shirt. I lost every time. You're not going to change God. I don't care if you go on a hunger strike and call it a fast. You are not going to change God. Prayer is not some tug of war that I'm committed to and I'm going to show and prove to God that here's the way it's going to be. You're going to lose every single time. The only good thing you may lose is weight in that kind of struggle. Number eight, prayer is God and man in partnership, listen carefully, releasing and establishing the will of God in the earth. Prayer is you and me In partnership with God, releasing the will of God and establishing the will of God in this earth. That is the avenue God has ordained to release His will and to establish His will in the earth. Boy, when you begin to see these things, saints, you get excited about praying. When you begin to pray and you start to see results, you get really excited. Because nothing is going to fulfill your joy more than for you to go to your heavenly Father, pray something specific, and see it happen without any manipulation of the hand of man. That's when you start getting excited that, wow, God is real. And then let me help you with something, because here's how the world thinks. God is not my imaginary friend that I won't let go of. Some people pray, but it's like they have an imaginary friend and they really don't expect anything to happen. They really don't expect things to change. And who am I to ask God this or to believe for that? No, prayer is not me having an imaginary friend that's not real. Prayer is me in partnership with God in which if I pray right, if I pray the way he taught me to pray and I learn to stand, I can see an answer to prayer. And when you see an answer to prayer, it makes God more real to you. You know, I've asked God, help me. Why? Is it just my personality? Why are you so real to me? Do I have a corner on God? Do I know something people don't know? I've really sought God in diagnosing why am I passionate? Why do I love him so much? Why is it so real to me? And people who I know serve God and know God, he's not real to them. Why? This is one of the reasons why I see Prayers answered. So I know he hears me. I know he loves me. I know he's there for me while you're just trying to believe it. 
let me, let me teach you to pray and, and start praying and see something happen. You'll come in the building bouncing off the wall like you're on drugs, hallelujah. Instead of just me looking like the one strung out on drugs. I'm not strung out except on the Lord, amen? Now, go to, go to Psalms 89. Psalms 89. And what I'm about to share with you now is one of the most important things I've learned about God and, and, and serving Him and trusting Him and walking with Him. See, there are certain things about God, saints, till you know that you know He's really this way, you can't be intimate with Him. You can't, you can't break through those, those veils, those walls that so many believers hit because they just don't know God. They love God, they serve God, but they don't know Him. Did you know one of the secrets of leadership here in our church is, and the reason it takes time for people to evolve into leadership, is because you've got to get to know me. And the more you really know me, who I am and how I am, the easier it is for you to flow with me to see things happen in this church. We get some outsider that's some great leader or some great Christian, and he comes in here and he doesn't know me. He could actually or she could actually do more harm to our church than help our church. God's that way. There's one thing I learned about God, that the minute I got that, everything began to fall into place. Everything began to change in my relationship with the Lord. I'm going to share that with you in my remaining time. And you need to open your heart, and you're not going to hear anything any more important than what I'm about to say to you. This is the most important thing about God that you have to settle in order to see Him move, in order to watch Him work, in order to change our world. So let me, let me share this with you about God. Psalms 89, verse 34, you need to mark it. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once I've sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever. And his throne as the sun before me, it shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. That is something about God no one taught me. And that is, when God speaks something, it is a covenant and it cannot be changed and it cannot be altered. It cannot be altered. He said, I swore David would have a seed, that seed would live forever, and that seed would have a throne, and that throne would be forever. And I'm here to tell you, God kept his promise to David. Jesus Christ came through the lineage of David. He's the seed of David, and he's sitting on a throne right now, and Jesus will live forever and ever and ever, and that throne will be forever and ever and ever. God kept his promise to David. And that's something about God you and I have to be renewed in our minds too, is that God, when he promises you something, you can count on it. When he says, here's the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be. And it doesn't matter how many of us think God is crazy, and that's a bad idea, God. Once he says it, it's a covenant. He binds himself to it. See, we, unlike God, try to get people to keep their word, but we don't keep ours. We try to get people to to keep their end of a deal, a contract, a covenant, but we don't keep our end. That's why there's so many lawyers, saints. We wouldn't need lawyers if we'd be Christians. We wouldn't need lawyers if we'd say what we mean, mean what we say, and keep our word. But why are there so many lawyers? Because we lie. Because we break covenant all the time. See, we don't know anybody like God. We haven't been around at large Anybody like God. Our parents break their word to us. Our kids break their words to us. Our employers break their words to us. Employees break their words to us. Friends break their words. Preachers break their words. And so we try to come to God and we struggle with what he said. And yet God said, anything I say is a covenant, I bind myself to it. Did you know God swears to his own hurt? And changes not. When God gave man, Adam and Eve, dominion in the garden, when he gave them authority, listen to me, I personally still think that was a bad idea. I'm serious. I'm trying to be honest with you. And it is kind of funny, but I'm being as serious and honest as I can be. I don't think that was a good idea. And I don't know why God didn't do what I do. If I say something and it's not a good idea, I go, King's X. I changed my mind. That's a bad decision. Here's what I'm going to do now. 
Do you know God's not that way? If God gives man authority, man has authority, and whatever man does with it is between man and man alone. God will honor his word in giving man dominion, in giving man authority in the earth to his own hurt. And change not. He binds himself to his own word. Boy, that's so powerful. What God says to you, he doesn't just bind you to it. He binds himself to it and he will not lie to you. In Numbers chapter 23 verse 19, the scriptures say, God's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Hath God not said it and shall he not make it good? Hath he not spoken it and shall he not do it? You know what he's saying? He's saying God's not like us. If God said it, he'll keep his promise. If God said it, he'll do it. Boy, that's pretty powerful. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says that God cannot lie. In Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18, the scriptures teach it is impossible for God to lie. That is so powerful. I was pastored in the Methodist church and one Sunday morning I caused no small stir. Actually, I caused a stir nearly every Sunday morning, but I really did a good job this Sunday morning. I was just preaching along there, and I I didn't even mean this to be the topic. I was just, in passing, said something. And what I said was, there are some things, saints, God just can't do. And I mean, it caused no small stir. What do you mean there's things God can't do? God can do anything, bless God. And man, I heard from everybody that, that service. I got hit up by everybody. I dare you stand in the pulpit and say there's some things God can't do. And so I was immature and young. And so I decided, all right, I messed up. I'll make it right the next week. So the next week I stand up and I say, I want to amend what I said. I didn't mean God can't do certain things. I mean he won't do certain things. And I thought that would make everybody happy. And on the way home, God rebuked me. I couldn't make anybody happy. I got the church upset. Now I got God upset. And God said, no, it's not that I won't, it's that I can't. So I came back the third Sunday and I repented for repenting. (laughs) And I said, there's some things God can't do. And you need to understand that about God or you're going to get confused and the devil's going to steamroll you over. God can't lie. God can't sin. God can't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God can't be tempted with evil. There's a lot of things God can't do. And that doesn't minimize the sovereignty of God. That doesn't reduce the almightiness of God Almighty. It simply means we serve such a just, holy, righteous God. If he tells you, I will not lie, then he cannot lie. If he says, I will never leave or forsake you, he can't leave or forsake you. It's not that he won't, it's that he can't. And I don't know what's wrong with everybody. I'm excited to know there's some things God can't do. I'm excited to know what he said he would do and what he told me to do. Because God's not going to do what he told me to do, and I better quit trying to do what God said he would do. Boy, I'm preaching better than you're responding. I am sharing some good stuff. And yet people have no idea how good what I'm saying really is and how it will revolutionize your life. Look at Isaiah 89 verse 11, and let me give you an illustration of God keeping his word. Of God, when he says something, when he speaks, it's a covenant. And God binds himself to his own word. God won't break his own word. In in Psalms 89 verse 11, The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. Now that's pretty clear. The heaven and the earth belong to the Lord. Psalms 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. And the world, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and the world and they that dwell therein. That's two scriptures that tell you plain that God owns the planet and everything in it. Amen? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein and the world even that dwells therein. The heavens and the earth are thine. They belong to God. Now see, a lot of people read that. They're taught that and they say, see there? 
The earth is God's, the fullness thereof, everything's God. God is sovereign then over his creation, so anything that happens to us is the will of God, and we just need to work it out. We just need to walk it out with God. Look at Psalms 115. Psalms 115, verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. That sounds good. Uh Uh-oh. But the earth hath he given to the children of men. Uh Uh-oh. Houston, we have a problem. Father, I'm confused. Now, I know you never get confused. And I, I love you so much for humbling yourself to come hear me. Because I know every one of you know more than me. You'll let me know right after the service. I know that you never are confused with the Bible. You're pure as the wind-driven snow. You're awesome. I struggle. When I read the Bible and it says, hey, the earth and the heavens are yours and the fullness thereof and the world that dwells therein, then you come along and say, oh, by the way, the heavens are mine. That's right. Then he says, the earth hath he given to the children of men. I have a conflict here. I know God can't lie, and those two seemingly contradict one another. And people say, well, which one's right? Is the earth ours or is it God's? Both. Both are right. Listen carefully. God retains ownership of this planet and everything in it. God owns the planet, but listen, He gave you and me stewardship and rulership in the earth. He gave you and I stewardship and rulership. You're just a steward of this earth. You're just a steward of your life. Your life belongs to God, not you, but you're a steward of it. Your body's not your body. It's the Lord's body. You're just a steward of it. Your money isn't even your money. You think God's asking 10% and you're just screaming like a a shot pig over having to give God 10%, not realizing you're just a steward of all of it. It all belongs to God and in the day of judgment, you're going to give an account on your stewardship of what really belonged to God. In, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, that is God's word. God hadn't changed his mind and he won't alter it. He gave Adam and Eve dominion in this earth. And he said, take dominion over the fish of the sea. Take dominion over my creation and subdue it. That means conquer it. That means rule in this, in this earth. And God said, I created man in my image and in my likeness and I gave them dominion. When God gave man dominion, listen, and this this, people don't pay attention. When God gave man dominion, he limited his dominion. God doesn't have dominion in the earth. He gave man dominion in the earth, so God in partnership with man has dominion. God has ownership of the planet. Man has stewardship of the planet. Listen, and we working with God have partnership. Stewardship, ownership, and partnership. That's the kingdom of God. Did you know God owns the cattle on a thousand hill? But if you don't feed them, they'll starve and die. God owns those cattle, but you have stewardship of them. The ranchers ought to understand this. The farmers ought to understand this. How many of us lease property? Someone else owns it, but we have a lease on it. And we can pretty much do what we want within boundaries... But we have to give an account to the owner on how we treat the land. God owns the planet. God owns everything. It all belongs to him. But he gave us stewardship. He gave us rulership. He gave us dominion. And we must now take dominion or things will not be dominated if we don't do what God called us to do. In Psalms chapter 8, one of my favorite Psalms, it talks about who is man. That thou thou art so mindful of man. What is man in the sense of you think of him and you, you gave him authority and dominion over all the works of your hands? Psalms chapter 8 says everything God created is the work of his hands and he gave it to us to rule and to be a steward over. He says that he created man a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. Saints, I love you. But there's probably only a handful or two of people in this great congregation 
that know how special you really are to God, that know how beautiful you are to God, how fearfully and wonderfully you've been created, how much glory and honor God has given you, and how God delights over you, and God loves you so much, and he's given you so much, and we are falling so short of the privileges we have in God, and the call that God's placed on our lives, that it's sad what sin and Satan and the world has done to our minds, done to our image, You look at even the church and it's hard to see the image of God. Sin and Satan has blitzed and blighted the image of God in man. And very few men believe God even loves them. Believe that God delights in them like God delights in you. Do you know why I stand so against drugs and people strung out on drugs? Stand so against alcoholism and people becoming alcoholics? Why do I why do I stand so against sexual perversion and darkness? Because I know in my heart of hearts, you're too great a creation of God to be fulfilled and satisfied by anything but God. You're so special. You're so unique. You're so fearfully and wonderfully created. There's not enough drugs on the planet to fulfill you and fill that void that God created. There's not enough alcohol on the planet to fulfill you and to fill that void in you. There's not enough perversion. There's not enough darkness and sin and Satan himself to make you happy and to fulfill you. You are so fearfully and wonderfully created by God Almighty. Only God and receiving his love for you and loving him back is going to fulfill you and make you happy in this world. The reason for that is... You're too valuable of a creation for anything else to make up for God. Nothing, nothing can touch you like God. Nothing can inspire you like God. Nothing can give you a high like God. Nothing can give you a buzz like God. Nothing can fulfill you like God Almighty. He created you in His image and in His likeness. And all sin and Satan does is blitz that image and that likeness. God gave us authority in this earth. God gave us dominion. Go to Psalms 82, and let's just blow this puppy up. Because people choke when you tell them how much God loves them. People choke when you tell them the position they have in the earth. They choke when you tell them the possibilities of what you can accomplish in this life as a partner with God. The effect you can have on this world as a partner with God. Look at Psalms 82. Verse 1, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you'll die like men, and you'll fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. My goodness gracious, that's powerful. God said, I have said. God said, God said. When he said, I have said, that's God saying, God said. God said that God said, you are gods. And children of the Most High. Why is that controversial? Why a few years ago was there a major mega meltdown in Christian circles over some preacher reading the Bible and saying we're gods? I don't know what's wrong with everybody. I have about concluded that people aren't bringing their Bibles to church. They're reading Mr. Magoo books. There's no doubt in my mind that people are not reading the Scriptures. Because God's the one that said, and he said, I have said. God said, God said, you are gods and children of the Most High. Now, in case you're confused, you are not God with a capital G. You're too dumb to be God. Did you hear me say that? I'm not God with a capital G. I'm too dumb to be God. Did you hear me say that? Okay, you did not hear me say that? Let me say the last part. You're too dumb to be God. I'm too dumb to be God with a capital G. But watch this. There's not one denomination on the planet that if I was to go in and ask them to say this, would rebuke me afterwards. And I'll try it on you. I'll let you do the the second half. I want you to say this after me. Say, thank you, Father, for making me a child of the Most High God. Did you know nobody will rebuke me after the service? Nobody will jump on me. You didn't even struggle saying it, but you said half the verse. 
the beginning of the verse says, Have I not said you are gods and children of the Most High God? See, you had no problem confessing, but even I have a problem asking you to confess the first half of the verse. Because I know it'll upset somebody. I'm surprised there had been a mass exodus out of here already, but sometimes you've got to purge the church. <laughs> Amen. We're going to read this Bible, and we're going to believe this Bible, because it's a covenant. It is binding. God is the one that said we're God. Now listen, what did he mean by saying we were gods? He didn't mean we're God like God. We're created a little lower than God. God, he is God. And there are no gods besides the Most High God, who's the God of all gods, who are no gods. I understand that. But what does he mean you're a God? He said, I have said. Well, if God said, God said, I should be able to find somewhere in the Bible where God already said this. And there are a host of scriptures. One of them is Exodus 22, verse 9. Exodus 22, verse 9. John 10, 34, Jesus said they were gods. Okay, let's back up here and give you a few other references. Genesis chapter 1, when God gave man authority, he said, take dominion, rule, subdue the earth. Psalms chapter 8, I created you a little lower than Elohim, the plural for God. What does he mean now? And let's settle it forever in our hearts where we don't get confused. He gave you authority in this earth, listen, to allow certain things and disallow certain things, to bind certain things, to loose certain things. He gave you authority to judge and in Exodus 22, he said, If you steal your neighbor's goods, I expect the righteous among them to judge and for you to pay back twice what you stole. Did you know if we don't hold the thief accountable, he'll steal more and more will suffer because we are not making righteous judgments in the earth. Where else did God say you are gods? How about chapter 82 that I just read, verse 1? God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the, among the what? Gods. What does he mean we're gods? He means that we have to choose to feed the poor or the poor won't get fed. We have to defend the, the innocent or the innocent will not be defended. We have to, to rid the, the needy out of the hand of the wicked. We have to stand up and in love speak the truth and say... On a national level, these politicians don't give a rip about the poor. They're using the backs of the poor to empower themselves and enslave the rest of us. We care about the poor. You care about the poor. And we need to do something for the fatherless. Pure religion and undefiled before God is to take care of the widows, the widows indeed, and the fatherless. We have to defend people that are innocent. And if we don't defend them, God won't. God can't. Did you know someone could stand right here and starve to death and food from heaven isn't going to fall? And God doesn't will for them to starve to death. And God's got the power to get them the food, but he gave us the authority in partnership with him to feed them and not just preach. Again, everything's God's. He has ownership, but he gave us stewardship. He gave us rulership. Again, my body's not even mine. It's God's. It's his temple and it's Sue's. That's the truth. I don't own my own body. I can't do with my hands what I want to. And if I take my hands and put a gun in it and shoot somebody, I'm going to stand before God and give an account for that. If I yield my tongue to darkness and powers of darkness and I curse and, and, and condemn people, I'll give an account for that in the day of judgment. Again, my body belongs to God. My body belongs to Sue. That's why I don't give a rip what you think about my hair. Man, if Sue wants it to grow so long, i got to climb up in a tree to go to the bathroom. I'm going to be climbing trees. I think that was a little too pictorial of an illustration. Did you know, ladies, you've been deceived by a generation of liars, cutthroats, murderers? You don't have a right to your own body. I don't even have a right to my own body. Again, my body belongs to God. It's his temple. My body belongs to my spouse in covenant. And your body 
belongs to a human being that is living in it that has to have your body to survive. Your body doesn't just belong to God, your spouse. If you're pregnant, your body belongs to that baby. To that baby. Did you know the Bible answers every single social problem we have? Yet it's hard to find a preacher that will even stand up and judge righteously and say, we're not going to allow this and we're going to allow that. We're going to bind this and we're going to loose this. We're going to choose this and God says it's right, so I say it's right. I don't care how crazy it sounds. I don't care how much the world pokes fun of it and makes fun of it. There's no such thing as gay marriage. There's no such thing as a man married to a man, a woman married to a woman. God said what a marriage is and if we don't want to be destroyed, we've got to be the one to say no. No. We disallow that in Jesus' name. We have to deal with child molestation or more kids are going to be molested. We have to say, nope, you kill somebody, we're a minimum of locking you up for life. Etc., etc., etc. We don't realize how much authority we have and how much is going on that God has nothing to do with. It isn't God allowing it, it's us allowing it. Jesus said after the resurrection in Matthew 28 verse 19, All power in heaven and in earth is given unto me. That means all power wasn't his before the resurrection. Nod your head, ex-spiritual, I'm trying to quit. When he stood up and said, all power is given unto me, both in heaven and in earth, now we got a man that was God. God made man, and now that man has all power. That word power is not dunamis. It's not dynamite power. It's not explosive power. It's the word for authority. Authority. God is sovereign and has the power. Man is a little sovereign with a little less with authority. When you put God's power with man's authority, you can ship the devil's saddle home. Amen. You know, when I vote, it's so discouraging. It's not even a raindrop in the ocean. I feel so powerless when I vote. Just before I vote on a national level, I at least ask my wife, are you going to cancel my vote? That's how powerless I feel. I even pray my children don't cancel my vote right out. It seems so insignificant. So little power. One little vote. And I've taught my children, you vote righteously. You vote your principles. You vote in line with truth. Not what you want or what you can get from somebody else. And so all I can do is pray that my children don't cancel my vote. But it's amazing how many times in 25 years my vote by my own sheep have, has been canceled out because people don't judge righteously. They don't know truth. They don't understand God's word. They don't understand the responsibility we have in this earth for what we allow. And then we blame God. Just like if this country does go belly up, you'll be shocked at how many churches will say, I wonder why God allowed that. God didn't allow squat. We did. We did. We did. We did. We did. We didn't pray. We didn't pray. We didn't know that prayer was releasing the will of God and establishing the will of God in the earth. And that's why things turn out like they do, not because God wills them. I'll quit with this. I'll hurry. We've all experienced anemic, out of control, egomaniac called a cop. If you're a cop, I love you. But we've all experienced anemic, out of control, maniac, egomaniac cop with his chest all blown up, and he jumps out in the middle of the road and throws his bony little old hand out, and you slam on the brakes, spill every liquid within a mile of you, smash your kid's forehead all over the dashboard as you're peeling it off, saying, put your seatbelt on quick. <laughs> Don't laugh, you've done it. Everybody's done it. Now, is he some power ranger off of Saturday, Saturday morning cartoons? Does this guy have something emanating from his hand? And he steps out in the road and he throws that hand out and power comes out of his hand and a two-ton vehicle comes to a screeching halt? How many of you know your car, my car, could squish him like a bug? Isn't that right? And I've thought this out. I believe I could get away with this in a court of law. I could, I could claim dyslexia. I could say, I thought I hit the brake. And I had a dyslexic moment. I hit the accelerator. And, but doesn't it feel good to think about that boom, boom? 
Doesn't that feel good? Boom, boom. And you just go on with your life. How was your day, honey? I ran over a cop. <laughs> Felt good. I humbled him. Why do you smash those brakes? Because listen, you know if you run over that cop, he doesn't have power to stop your car, but he has authority. And if you run over his authority, now you're accountable to a courthouse, a judge, and a jury that can take your life. What we struggle with as Christians is we keep thinking we need more power. We need more power. No, God's got the power. What we have is authority. If we'll yield to God and walk with God and learn how to pray, learn how to stand on his will and on his word, we've got the authority. God's got the power. And I'm telling you, the devil will have to flee. Things will change if we pray in the name of the Holy Child Jesus. One more thing quickly. How many of you know the cop in Durant doesn't have authority in Sherman? That won't work for him in Sherman. Did you know your authority is limited and you need to learn your jurisdiction? Just like I don't have authority over your children, you do. That's why I didn't usurp authority over your children in my decision for us as a church. You have jurisdiction over your children. You have jurisdiction over your spouses, not me. I have a limited jurisdiction over us as a corporate body, but I have no power whatsoever. I better, I better yield to God who has the power He's the owner of everything. I'm the steward of everything. And in partnership with God, I can see things changed. Amen. Wow. Praise God. Let's stand. I want to pray for you. For additional free CDs and a catalog of all of our teaching CDs, please contact Doe Wayne Sheriff Ministries, Post Office Box 427, Durant, Oklahoma, 74702. And may the...